Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this first edition of Resilience and Adaptation, Life After the Corona Crisis. This is a new series brought to you by 1014 and the American Council on Germany. And I'm Katja Donovan, Chief <laughs> Officer of 14. Starting today, each week, 1014 and the ACG plan to join forces to bring you interesting discussions with experts from both sides of the Atlantic about the pressing challenges that are now surfacing around the globe. The corona pandemic is not just a public health challenge. It is a serious test for open democracies as they grapple with how to balance public health and public safety concerns with civil liberties. Most of us are temporarily giving up some of our freedoms to help keep the spread of the virus at bay. But how far can and should countries go to protect the public's well-being? Joining us today to talk about this are Corey Schake and Stefan Cornelius. Thank you both for joining us. It's great to be with you guys. An ACG Young Leader alumna, Corey Schake is the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Before joining AEI, she was the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. In addition to her work in various think tanks, she has had a distinguished career both in government and in academia. And Stefan Cornelius has been the foreign editor of the German daily, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, for nearly 20 years. Prior to that, he served as the paper's Washington correspondent. In his reporting career, he's covered domestic politics in Germany and the United States, as well as foreign policy and national security issues. We'd like to remind our viewers and our listeners that both ACG and 1014 are independent nonpartisan organizations, and the views expressed here today are those of our speakers. Also, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function on Zoom or send me an email at sokol at acg.org. So let's uh, get started. To flatten the curve, about six weeks ago, lockdown measures were introduced in both countries. Now we're witnessing the first steps to reopen parts of life. In both countries, there has been some jockeying back and forth between the federal and state governments. Stefan, Let's start with you regarding the situation in Germany. What strikes you the most as you reflect on the decisions to lock down and now to reopen the economy and society at large? Well, I think the most striking feature is that those, all those decisions are, seem to be somehow chaotic, but in the end, they do reflect some kind of societal dynamic we all experience right now in the West. You cannot take those grave measures without having the backing of a majority. So this is sort of a ping pong game of public perception, of um, threat perception, and the uh, preparedness to react or sort of the openness to, uh, to, to accept measures which would have been otherwise unthinkable to our societies. So um, in a moment of growing fear and tension, preparedness to join the herd was much more visible and there. Now, since we're slowly going in reverse and things are opening up, we are so, we're seeing the opposite effect. Things are getting slowly out of control. And the kind of uh, dynamism, the kind of um, uh, uh, synchronization we had is getting lost to a much more fragmented uh, style of, uh, of a political behavior and a much more uh, agile debate now in our societies and this is what's actually happening around Germany uh, tension is breaking loose and people are starting to debate whether this is all worth it and how long we can actually sustain it economically physically psychologically whatever all teachers we all debate so we are seeing sort of the first curve of the pandemic was one of growing tension, of growing appreciation for tough measures, but now of even a more dynamic explosion of freedom or desire for freedom. Thank you. And Corey, how would you describe the decision-making process uh, in the US at the federal and at state level? 
So I'm struck by three things. The first is what a big sloppy mess um, the American government is. And that's not news, right? Uh, we very seldom have grand strategy or whole of government operations. The United States gets stuff right by getting it wrong. Um, so, so that's the first thing. It's genuinely shocking how bad the federal government is at doing its job. What a wide diversity of different kinds of responses we have by different states and different cities. And that's not that unusual for American society. You know, very often, I think particularly America's friends give us more credit um, than we deserve. And this is what America looks like. It's big divergent uh, attitudes about stuff, angry public debates, um, and then we slowly, slowly work our way towards having um, a decent answer that everybody or the majority of the American population buys into. My second response looking at it is to drop to my knees in prayers of gratitude for the founding fathers of my country giving us so many distributed sources of political power and having the great genius to understand that putting different constituencies' interests into open competition is how you get better answers. Because some governors have had an excess of caution to protect the public, California, Washington State, um, and you see how quickly the curves have flattened in those spaces. Some states were slow to recognize the, the dimensions of the problem, New York and New Jersey, for example, but governors snapped quickly into different kinds of reactions um, and are course correcting as they see. And then you see the shocking disgrace of President Trump's recklessness dispensing genuinely dangerous um, half-baked ideas from the, from the White House and having very often to be corrected by the experts gathered on the task force. So if we only had the President of the United States, a lot more Americans would be dead and a lot more economic damage done to our country. So, so I'm grateful for all the different ways that you can affect government decision making in the United States. And the third thing is, um, it's so beautiful to be reminded how many Americans are civic minded, are gathering at elementary schools to dispense food to the less fortunate amongst us, who are voluntarily, although they would unlikely be affected by the virus themselves, are voluntarily quarantining in order to protect um, our fellow citizens and our, our neighborhoods um, from the expansion of the crisis, the way religious organizations are stepping to the fore to find ways to be useful. And of course, all of the experimentation and innovation that is the salvation of the American public time and time and time again. Let me um, maybe take a step back. I want to thank you both for those, those opening comments. Um, it, it appears to me that, that governments around the world um, are all operating in a crisis mode. And a permanent mode of crisis can, of course, endanger open societies and liberal democracies. And so I think it's worthwhile to take a few minutes and, and talk a little bit about the use of executive powers. In both the United States and the United Kingdom, there have been a lot of allusions to war and war powers by the heads of state. In Germany, the opposite has been true. But the question remains, to what degree are leaders making use of special executive powers in Germany and the United States? And for how long is it acceptable for them to do so in the name of public health and public safety? Corey, you talked very eloquently about the varied response at the federal, state, and local levels. And of course, um, 
President Trump has been criticized for not using his executive powers soon enough in some senses. For example, some people think that he should have invoked the Defense Production Act to force industries to produce um, medical equipment earlier than he actually did. And you analyze this earlier this month in an article in The Atlantic. Now Trump is using his executive powers to stop immigration. You just said the federal response has been a, a big sloppy mess, but can you tell us a little bit more about the president and about the federal response and what you maybe think could have been handled differently? <laughs> okay, I'm going to take the rest of our time together to do this. <laughs> so a couple of things. Uh, as you uh, very nicely noted, I wrote a piece in The Atlantic expressing my mystification that an administration that has been so diabolically creative in finding ways to use federal power to uh, prohibit immigration, to penalize American allies um, with, by declaring them national security threats in trade disputes, a lot of that kind of stuff. The thing that's so shocking to me about President Trump's management of the, the pandemic is that they have brought none of that creativity to ways to use executive power to actually protect American lives during a health crisis. They, they found lots of ways to do it to advance their uh, narrow, stingy, America first agenda, but they haven't seemed to find a bunch of ways to do it. You know, the president had to be driven to declaring the the Defense um, Production Act and still hasn't actually used it, has called on companies to voluntarily use it. So, so it's actually surprising that it took, what, six weeks before um, the White House uh, tried to use the pandemic to the effect of preventing immigration, which has long been an administration priority and they're still not using executive powers creatively or adroitly for the protection of Americans. Um, maybe I'll stop there. Oh, uh, one more thing about the, the presidency. You know, the president makes all kinds of outsized uh, reckless claims like that he's going to declare the economy open, but it just serves to <laughs> remind us all that actually the American president has very little power and that much of the power actually resides with mayors and governors in our system and that also the president's genuine strongest power as Teddy Roosevelt reminded us at the turn of the 20th century is the ability to unite and mobilize the American public on behalf of a political agenda. And the president's actually, once again, not proving very good at that. He's good at uh, firing up the 39 or so percent of Americans who already agree with him, but he's not persuading anybody who doesn't already agree with him. And you can see that in support for, um, uh, for governors, for um, the way that People are moving into the space left by a lack of presidential leadership. I mean, my favorite example is the Gates Foundation stepping forward to provide assistance to the World Health Organization in excess of what the United States government was going to provide before President Trump said he wouldn't anymore. And Stefan, in, in your opening comments, you said that things are getting out of control and, and people are asking the question of whether it's worth abiding by some of the rules that are in place. It seems to me that in times of emergency, people often accept exe the use of executive powers because they believe in the need for strong government to maintain control. But what happens when a crisis lasts longer than initially in expected? And I think we're coming up on that point now, particularly in Germany. Early on, um, already in, in late March, you had a piece in the Süddeutsche Zeitung where you talked a little bit about this issue and whether it's okay 
for a democracy to operate in a state of emergency and for how long that's the case. Can you talk a little bit about some of these executive powers in Germany and some of your concerns about where we're going? Right, well, it's a, it's a vast issue. And um, let me probably start with some kind of definitory, the definition thing. Uh, in, in talking about executive powers is a totally different um, pair of boots here in Germany than it is in the US. And I wouldn't that much talk about executive power, but rather about um, executive ability. Um, the big difference to what I see what happens in the US and Germany is that we do have an executive, that we do have a, a machinery, a bureaucracy, which actually works. And um, a healthcare uh, bureaucracy, a healthcare infrastructure, a kind of um, a system which tests, gets results delivered, uh, has a kind of uh, assessment system and sort of has a hierarchy of uh, which works in the federal system between the Bund and the lender, uh, and even within Europe. So that's sort of the executive privilege we enjoy that our executive branch of the government actually does work. Um, the, the government itself hasn't really claimed new powers. I mean, the powers the lender or the federal system did claim is pretty similar to what the US did, um, uh, cutting down freedom of movement, um, uh, forcing people to stay at home, closing schools, things like that. Um, now we do approach uh, the moment where we are opening up. And this is where your point comes in, Steve. I mean, um, our societies all constantly deliberate the, the pros and cons, the, 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 the sort of the, the price we have to pay for that kind of shutdowns. Um, this is sort of symptomatic for a democratic and open society that we ask those questions, that we challenge them, and that pretty much everyone has a say. I just wrote a piece yesterday having the same kind of argument um, since our federal parliament president, Wolfgang Schäuble, who you all know, uh, gave a pretty provocative interview um, and saying, well, he as 70, I think, six-year-old uh, high-risk person um, onto a wheelchair, uh, we all have to die one one way. And if you look at the figures and um, if you look at their, the, 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 the casualty details, um, you come up with, um, at least in Germany, with sort of a, a, a kind of uh, recognition that the crisis was spared to those who are, are significantly younger than 60, but even uh, higher than that and that our casualty numbers are extremely low, the mortality numbers. So uh, the majority of society really hasn't experienced the brunt of the crisis. They haven't been struck by illness or they haven't seen the hospital pictures as people in Northern Italy or New York saw. So here comes in the question, uh, how do you convince a majority they stick to this restraints, this, this kind of confinement to home and endure huge economic um, uh, hits for a severe time without knowing how to get out of it um, and keep that democratically legitimate. Um, this is what we are starting to debate on now. I can't tell you the outcome, uh, but arguing with wartime metaphors and with um, uh, reigning in executive privileges, which definitely the Chancellor does not have, uh, wouldn't get you that far in Germany. So I guess we'll are at the beginning of a very vivid and probably even brutal debate because those who were hit most economically will now uh, scream loudest. Thank you. Uh, so let, let me uh, take over and uh, I think this is a very interesting point and uh, let's, let's zoom in on that a little bit more and take a closer look at um, you know, what we might call a trade-off between public safety and individual rights especially with regard to uh, free movement and, and privacy also. So, you know, in a crisis, people are willing to accept restrictions for the sake of safety and health for everyone, but there are limits, as, as you uh, already mentioned, Stefan. So, uh, let's start with Corey. Um, we're seeing more and more protests here in the United States. People, of course, are worried about their businesses, their jobs, unemployment rates are skyrocketing. So what do you think about the reopening process? Uh, you know, this is what free societies do. We debate trade-offs between, <clears throat> between alternative goods, right? There's enormous damage to our economy from having been shut down for so long. 
And it's also exacerbating inequality in the United States uh, because there are people who can afford to quarantine and then people who don't have the luxury of that, either because they're doing essential jobs, garbage collectors, uh, stocking grocery store shelves, even before you get to the heroic people working in our hospitals and elder care homes. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, you know, the costs in the United States, the human costs are just exorbitant and tragic. Today is the day where the United States fatalities from the COVID-19 pandemic will surpass the total number of killed in action in the Vietnam War. And that was across more than 10 years. This is in the space of a few months. So there's a lot of hesitation to move forward. Different communities are gonna weigh those things differently, right? Communities uh, in you know, rural Montana that don't have the population density of New York City are gonna make different choices than New York City does. But, but I think, as Thomas Jefferson told us, there is no safe repository for power other than the judgment of the people. And so that's what free societies get well. We may not get the optimal answer. You know, the, there are communities in the United States that in my judgment are being extraordinarily reckless the state of Florida, for example, moving so fast to open beaches. But in free societies, people can make different judgments about the risks they run and the consequences they want to accept. The interesting thing, if I may add that, the interesting part of for me is how, how um, little risk averse we are, how, how little we understand about risk. And that's a total new experience. I mean, especially the German society is totally risk averse. And uh, I mean, so the, the, the government takes care of pretty much everything in your life. Um, uh, the social system is, is well established and people take it for granted that their life isn't being uh, ripped apart. And that's happening right now. And this kind of new experience brought, this, brought people together, really built society, uh, strength within society. But it didn't last long because we don't have that experience to know where it will end. And since we do not have that kind of knowledge, since we are all in this for the first time, I think we are on the learning curve. And um, I fully agree with uh, Corey. This is all about deliberation within a free society. Um, and, and in this kind of deliberation, you do find politicians are trying to, to, to make it to, to benefit from it. And, and we do see it here in Germany with the rise of the CDU candidates for uh, the succession of Angela Merkel. And they are battling for turf and they're using the situation to advance. Um, and so in the end, it will not be a chancellor or a, a president who decides on when to leave and how to get out of this. It'll be all of us. Uh, it's sort of a common mood. It's a perception on how we feel threatened. And right now, I think we feel less threatened. And this is why things are opening up. And when there will be the second wave, and Germany probably gets worse numbers and casualties, things might reverse again. And so we're in for a long back and forth or ping pong game of, of assessment. And I'm not, I'm not sure where this, where this will end. Now, Stefan, uh, if I just may uh, uh, ask a follow-up question, I think um, you know Chancellor Merkel. She cautioned against uh, a quick reopening last week, but she also acknowledged that uh, these restrictions are an imposition uh, on our democracies. So, if if you narrow that down, is it uh, is it difficult in a democracy more so maybe in other um, uh, uh, um, other countries? to find the right balance between people's rights and then the necessary or, uh, you know, the appropriate steps to protect uh, the public. As I said, none of us was in that before and we have never made that kind of decision. We never balanced this and we never experienced it firsthand. And those of us who are losing jobs right now, those of us who lose loved ones and um, probably pay themselves a price in terms of their health, um, and even life uh, will have a different assessment than those who walk through it nicely. And 
I always, within our paper, I always caution people to take our sort of editorial staff life as a typical one. We don't see in those families who live in precarious situations, who live cramped, who don't have the money, and who live on the edge. Uh, we don't experience domestic violence, at, at least I hope so. And we don't have these kind of tensions others do have in our societies. So we do not know what, how the fabric of all our society looks like right after this. How much will be ripped apart? How much trust into state, into government, into 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 democracy will actually survive. Probably people are fed, fed up and tired and sick and tired of that kind of being lectured and said, um, will succumb much more to a more authoritarian uh, rule. Uh, if you look at Austria, for example, where Sebastian Kurz, Kurz the, the young chancellor, is riding high in the polls and he's running this, cover, uh, this country with sort of uh, 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 an iron fist. Um, it feels weird to me that we should appreciate that kind of leadership, but on the other side, it generates majorities, it generates, uh, it generates um, uh, backing from societies. And uh, so each of us is now making different experiences in this. And um, I wrote very much at the beginning of this, um, bad governing will even get worse and good governing will get better and good democracies might become stronger and bad democracies might become weaker and I think we really see that this crisis is fostering all the main sort of characteristics in our societies. Mm. Perhaps related to that um, Stefan there's a, a question um, from the German Consul General in in Boston who wrote in Chancellor Angela Merkel said in her government statement on April 23rd that during her entire term in office, hardly any other decision has been as difficult for her as the decision to restrict personal freedoms. And indeed, the pandemic is an imposition on democracy. A free and independent press is central during this crisis. Has your work as a journalist changed? And how high do you think the probability is that populists will use the pandemic as an instrument to promote division within our societies. Right now, I'm totally optimistic on, on, on both those features, both our journalistic life and uh, the value of journalism, and on the other side, populist impact um, uh, has gone sort of from a democratic perspective much better. I mean, journalistically spoken, um, we are doing better than everyone any time before. Um, we now experience here in Germany our so kind of Trump moment where we rise in, in circulation and subscription, digital readership is going up. Um, so people really, really value um, grown up information and classic journalism. So that's the good thing. The bad thing is, well, advertising is going down, so economically we're doing bad. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, the core journalism is revalued, it is appreciated, and that's something which gives me high. Um, I mean, which satisfaction this is really pleasing. Um, on um, on the on the um, populist side, uh, at least in Germany, they're not they're not reaching an, to anywhere anymore. So they lost their voice. And as I said, if democracies are strong and if party systems are strong, those extremist parts are um, reduced in in the ability to to project. Um, in those countries where they are already in charge, Poland, Hungary, uh, uh, look at the kind of populist the American president is, they're getting stronger. And uh, so I wonder uh, whether we've seen, whether we see a different dynamic in, in, as, as time continues, and, and as we're in this for a couple of more months. But for the time being, I'd rather say, um, people really value what they have. And if they forgot about what they used to have, I mean, if they, if, if they turn to a different system, they just take it as it comes. Let me remind our viewers that if you have a question, you can use the chat function and uh, we'll try to fold those into the remaining time that we have with Corey and Stefan. Uh, Stefan, you were talking, yeah, go ahead. Just Stefan. one quick question because you mentioned or uh, Council General mentioned mentioned uh, the chancellor. And I think that's interesting because probably few of us who were grew up in the West and sort of 
take the system for granted. Um, have had to make that deliberation she made, and I think that's true. And I, uh, I, I know it because I occasionally talk to her. She is truly convinced that those democratic achievements of free speech, of openness, of having a parliament to debate, are so valuable, are so hard, so, so important to fight for that she took that sort of in the center of her, um, of her. Uh, uh, sort of of her speeches, of her argument, why she did what she did. And to us Westerners, this seems to be weird and awkward, but I guess that's a sound which resonated much, much more to those who grew up in the East or under under not democratic systems. So thank you for that. Um, and, and Stefan, earlier you, you mentioned the fragmentation of the political debate in Germany, um, Corey, to a certain degree, I think we can see some of that happening here. Um, and you were talking before about you know the role of governors that they have to play, um, but also at the federal level. And of course, this is um, an election year in the United States. Um, and I, I guess the the question I would have for each of you, Corey, with a view to this fall, um, Stefan, with a view to next year in Germany, how concerned are you about the ability? to hold national elections, but also about how voters might respond to the outcome if their favorite candidate doesn't win. Obviously, this is more of a concern here in the United States, but Corey, can we get your thoughts on what's happening over the next few months with regard to primaries? Um, what's happening with regard to the conventions? You know, They probably won't take place. All these little steps on the road to the election in November. Uh, so first and most importantly, I don't have any doubt the election will be held on its scheduled time. We're going to have a big, loud, boisterous debate about how to do that, especially if we still have large numbers of Americans um, living in places where it's not safe to congregate at the polls. So right now, the fight has already started about mail-in ballots, online registration. And again, we have the experience of uh, American states uh, having very different approaches, right? Oregon and Washington State uh, are way ahead of the rest of us in how they think about doing this without having to congregate. So we're going to have a big, loud, messy debate, but I don't have any doubt that the election will be held. To your point about the primaries, uh, you know, with the concession of uh, Senator Sanders, the primaries are decided, both for Republicans and Democrats. And what we are going to see between now and November is, you know, Again, it's going to be weird because you probably can't have nominating conventions in the way we have had them because it won't be safe for that many Americans to congregate in close quarters. But what American society is fabulous at is experimentation, adaptation, and innovation. So it's going to be a roller coaster ride as the different Republican and Democratic establishments and all sorts of other groups uh, try and figure out how to make the case for their candidates. Politically, I don't think there's any way that the president can avoid the election being a referendum on how he has handled the pandemic. Uh, it would be malpractice on behalf of the Democratic candidate and his campaign, not to try and focus all of the attention on now, what, 56,000 dead Americans in the space of three months, um, and unemployment higher than it was in 1932 during the Great Depression. On the president's side, he's clearly trying to avoid responsibility for anything uh, and the election's going to be a test of whether he can persuade Americans uh, that he's done better than others will have done. On respecting the consequences of the election, um, 
I am actually concerned that President Trump's willful destruction of so many of the norms that undergird democracy in America uh, will carry through a refusal to acknowledge an outcome in which he, if he is not the victor. But I'm also hugely confident that journalists and the League of Women Voters and the American Civil Liberties Union and state, uh, state voter establishment, like all of that's going to come into play. And I'm supremely confident that whatever the outcome of the election is in November, that it will be revealed and it will, Americans will force both the winner and the loser to acknowledge that and act in good faith going forward. So of course, um, in, in politics, between now and November is a political eternity and a lot can happen as, as we can see. Um, for you, Stefan, the, the German election is just light years away, not until the fall of, of next year. Um, but do you have any thoughts on the political jockeying at the moment? You mentioned that the other candidates to take over the lead of the CDU are using the current pandemic as, a, as an opportunity to um, position themselves as, as leaders in a time of crisis. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's happening in the political landscape in Germany? You know, it used to be, there used to be times when politics were, was pretty much made with a, with a calendar, with sort of dates in mind, elections, um, whatever, uh, budgets to be negotiated, or summits, G7, NATO stuff, whatever. Um, when I, are uh, just to give you to finish this example, when this year, when this year uh, started, January 1st, I was asked to give a couple of speeches and I prepared sort of a standard speech, which I held, I think, once. Uh, and it said, well, this will be the most, the least eventful year of the, uh, of the life. <laughs> and I, I pretty much argued there was not a single uh, important election in Germany and not even in Europe blooming in this year. Uh, there was a budget negotiated and the only thing we had to go through was the European budget negotiations and some sort of final touches on Brexit. So that was it. The, and then came Iran and then came the impeachment and I can't know what came. I almost forgot about all of it again. Uh, so here we go and you ask me to, to give a prediction of next year. I can't. Um, what definitely the crisis showed and probably the majority of people will remember is that calm but um, author authoritative leadership is valuable. Uh, so they might turn to a candidate who is probably more experienced and not sort of the rookie from around the corner. Um, the CDU has postponed its leadership battle and to me it looks now much um, more open than even before because all those um, candidates on the table are, uh, are, are simply not convincing enough. And we might see the moment that the Prime Minister of Bavaria, Markus Söder, who, who made himself a big name now during the crisis, will step forward and will claim the candidacy for himself or for the Conservative side. On the Social Democratic side, uh, you saw and you do see that the Finance Minister, Olaf Scholz, who lost the leadership battle in the Social Democrats, is rising the polls and is doing actually quite well in managing the crisis. Now, let's see how we turn out even economically in a couple of months. But if he then turns to or proves to be the calm and, and success, successful leader as we see him now, he might become the candidate on that side. The Greens have totally disappeared and it's pretty tough for our opposition party to to make an impact in such a crisis. This is the executive moment, it's not the opposition moment. So here we go, and I see we'll see a lot of chalking happening by the end of the year, uh, but then public memory is short, and God knows what we'll talk about in a year's time, or even summer 2021, because that's the time when we'll talk about the decision in the German federal uh, uh, election. So, Stefan, I don't, I don't mean to brag, but I made an even worse prediction than your prediction from January, once upon a time. Right before 
the end of the Cold War, I confidently predicted that East Germany wouldn't uh, accept this openness because you didn't have a managerial class in East Germany that was that had a different view that was open to perestroika and glasnost. So I'm sorry, my friend, I take the trophy for the worst yeah. prediction ever in German politics. <laughs> Happy to leave it to you. <laughs> so as we, as we wrap up, we have one um, perhaps final question from one of our viewers who writes, are you concerned about the stability of democratic institutions and practices in your country? And are we seeing a constitutional crisis in either country? I don't know who wants to go first, but I leave it up to the two of you. I'll take a swing at that. Um, I am very often during the Trump administration, deeply anxious about the damage the president's doing to democratic practices in the United States and to the norms of behavior of American national leaders. I think he's genuinely put uh, journalists at risk, but not just at risk of, of uh, you know, public disapproval, but at risk of actual violence by the way he calls journalists enemies of the state and encourages recklessness, encourages a violent racism as he did in Charlottesville and other places, encourages the worst kind of reckless behavior in uh, calling for people to, to challenge by force governor's lockdown orders. Um, what I have been pleasantly surprised by in the three and a half years of President Trump's uh, administration is how well the, uh, the, the institutions of governance have held up despite this. And uh, while I have, uh, as a conservative, uh, I'm not a natural fan of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, but I think she's actually shown a terrific standard of how to insist on the prerogatives of her office despite efforts by the president to corrode or overturn them. Um, and I think she has shown the way for governors and others to also assert their prerogatives um, and, and box in the president's worst tendencies. But a lot is going to depend on the election in November. Again, as a conservative, um, I think it will be genuinely bad for the United States if President Trump is reelected, because it will mark us as a different kind of country. You know, uh, Americans have higher risk tolerance than most other free societies. But it's one thing to make a reckless choice and take a leap when you're mad at the establishment as Americans were in 2016. It's a whole nother thing to have seen the president govern the way he does and behave the way he does and to choose to reaffirm that by reelecting him. And Stefan, what are your thoughts? Well, quick answer, no to both fears. I, uh, I do see our constitution to be stable. I do see our system to be stable and uh, actually to be a, a kind of a model in these days as well. I mean, kind of governance which is being uh, performed in Berlin is well received all over the world. And there's even trust building now in Europe again with the new recovery packages which were decided upon and which didn't saw, see any kind of germ bickering about it. So. I think um, we're on a good path here, but um, um, I can only add to what Corey said from watching the US from here. I, a, a bit, um, uh, I'm, I'm a bit worried about that growing fear of true instability, not only constitutional instability, but also even physical instability, which sort of points all to this election day in November. And I think, uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I, sometimes I don't recognize America again. I wonder where is the self-confidence of a country which invented democracy. 
and which knows how democracy works. And we here in Europe urgently need America to lead. Um, we cannot afford to be torn in a global crisis between China and the US. And we need to take a side which is our side. And I think for that, the US has to come back um, in, in the realm of, of uh, classical Western democracies, democracies and uh, abstain from populism, which is only poisonous and dividing. I think, I think we can fairly say we are in uncertain times uh, and um, we'll, we'll see what, what happens in the, in the next month. And as optimists, you know, we, of course, we, we hope for the best. Uh, Cory Schake and Stefan Cornelius, a big thanks to you both for the thought-provoking and lively discussion. We truly enjoyed it. On behalf of I'm talking with you, my friends. <laughs> yeah. On behalf of the team and the American Council in Germany, thank you. We look forward Thank to being in person, hopefully soon, but we're grateful to you for this opportunity to speak with you today. I'll be on the first flight, which is open. <laughs> that sounds good. We, we will hold you to that, Stefan. And, uh, you know, this has been such an insightful conversation with both of you. We should think about repeating it again. Um, but thank you for helping us parse some of these very difficult issues in this unprecedented time. And of course, for our viewers, Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for your questions. Um, and to everybody, until next time, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.